What is Christianity? Part 3 Chapter 3 Worship and Rites What are the methods of worship in Christianity? Before we know this, it will be appropriate to understand the basic principles governing Christian worship. According to Raymond Abba these principles are four, namely, Abba, p. 3. 1. Worship is in reality gratitude for the sacrifice made by the Word of God, that is, Jesus on behalf of man. 2. True and proper worship can only be done by the act of the Holy Spirit. In his letter to the Romans Paul says, likewise the Spirit helps us in our nearness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with signs too deep for words, Rom. 826. 3. Worship is in reality a collective act which the church only can fulfill. If a person wishes on an individual level to carry out worship, then such worship is only possible if he becomes a member of the church. 4. Worship is the basic function of the church. It expresses itself to the world in the form of the body of Jesus. Mass. There are many methods of worship in Christianity. But we can only explain two methods in this short article which are adopted regularly and are dealt with repeatedly in discussions of the subject. One of these is mass priests refer to it as namaz in order to make Muslims understand. According to F.C. Burkitt, Burkitt, p. 152, the procedure for mass is that people gather in the church every day, morning and evening. One person from amongst them reads a port ion of the Bible. The portion is generally a section from the Old Testament. During such recitation, all present remain standing. At the end of each hymn, bells are rung and prayers are said. At the time of such prayers, it is desirable as a confession of sins to shed tears. This procedure continued from the 3rd century AD up to present day, and has been emphasized in some writings. Baptism This is the first ritual of Christianity. This is a form of bathing which is administered to those who enter the Christian faith. Without it, nobody could be said to be a Christian. Behind this ritual lies the doctrine of redemption. The Christian belief is that a man by means of baptism dies for the sake of Jesus and then becomes alive again. By means of death, he receives the punishment of the original sin. He then in his new life acquires a free will. Those who wish to enter the Christian faith must pass through a preliminary stage in which they acquire the basic teachings of the faith. In that period, they are not called Christians, but are known as catechumens. And they do not have permission to partake in the Passover. Then some time before Easter, or the Pentecost, they are given the baptism, Burkitt. p. 150-152. The church has a special room to administer the baptism. Special people are designated for the act. According to the well-known theologian Cyril, the person undergoing baptism is made to lie in the baptistry with his back facing the west. Then such person extends his hand to the west and says, O oh Satan, I withdraw myself from you and each of your acts. Then he faces the east, and verbally proclaims the cardinal doctrines of Christianity. Then his clothes are removed, and he is anointed head to foot with an oil. Thereafter, he is put into the pool of baptism. The person administering the baptism then asks him three questions, whether he believes in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the prescribed manner. The proposed convert answers to each question, yes, I believe. Then he is taken out from the pool, and again his forehead, ears, nose and chest is anointed with the oil. He is then made to wear white clothes which is indicative of his purification from previous sins by means of baptism. The group of persons undergoing baptism then together enter the church and for the first time partake in the Passover. Passover. This is the most important rite after adoption of Christianity and it is celebrated in commemoration of the sacrifice of Jesus. One day before the alleged arrest of Jesus, follows. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and blessed, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body. And he took cup, and when he had given thanks he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Matt. 26 26. Luke adds Jesus thereafter said, Do this in remembrance of me. The rite of Passover is held in fulfillment of this order. 
the well-known Christian scholar Justin Martyr, quoted by Burkitt, p. 165-167, explains the procedure of Passover, namely that there is a gathering every Sunday at church. At the beginning thereof some prayers and hymns are sung. Then the participants embrace each other and convey their good wishes. Bread and wine is then brought. The head of the gathering takes the bread and wine and makes prayers of blessing to the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. All participants answer Amen. The deacons of the church thereupon distribute the bread and wine amongst the participants. The bread immediately by means of this act becomes the body of Christ, and the wine his blood, all participants by eating and drinking refresh their doctrine of redemption. After Justin, there have been and continues to be much change in the procedure and use of words in regard to this rite. But, t he basic aspect of the rite is that the bread and wine, when given by the head of gathering to the participants, immediately according to Christian belief change their nature and become the body and blood of Jesus, despite their outward appearance. Cyril writes, quoted by Britannica. When the head completes his prayers, then the Holy Spirit descends upon the bread and wine and changes them to body and blood. It is a matter of controversy and debate for years as to how bread and wine upon a moment became changed to body and blood. To the extent that the Protestant sect which emerged in the 16th century rejected this doctrine. According to it, this rite is merely in memory of the sacrifice of Jesus. It did not, however, accept the transformation from bread to body, and wine to blood. Apart from the Passover, this rite has other names, namely Eucharist, Sacred Meal, Holy Communion. Apart from baptism and the Passover, there are five other rites according to the Roman Catholic sect. The Protestant sect, however, did not accept these rites. Calvin writes, Calvin, Confession 76. From amongst these rituals, only two were prescribed by our Saviour, baptism and the Passover, because we regard the seven made under the aegis of the Pope as fabricated. In view of the fact that there is no consensus on these rites, and that there is no need to be acquainted with them, we shall not with them for the sake of brevity. Part 2 A Resumo of the History of Christianity Chapter History of the Israelites, see generally, Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics, an Overview Israel is the name of Jacob, Jacob, who had twelve sons, and their children are known as the children of Israel, Bonu Israel. In ancient times, God had chosen this house to assume the office of prophethood. Innumerable prophets were sent from amongst this house. The original home of the children of Israel was the area of Palestine. But the Amalekites after having usurped this land forced them to slavery. They then during the time of Moses obtained freedom from such slavery. However, they could not regain Palestine at the time of the demise of Moses. Thereafter, Jushu, Joshua, and then Caleb, became prophet, Jushu, conquered a large portion of Palestine by fighting the Amalekites. Thereafter, the children of Israel faced onslaughts from all sides. At that time, their life was analogous to tea hat of the Bedouin Arabs, and to a large extent was based on tribal lines. Hence, they looked with respect on that person who, on the basis of tribal law, excelled in intertribal warfare. If such person moreover displayed military insight and ability, they made him their leader in external wars. Such leaders were referred to by them as, Judges. The book of the Bible entitled, Judges, is a narrative of their efforts, and that era was appropriately named as, the Era of the Judges. Whilst the people of Israel successfully defended external attacks during the Era of the Judges, They were also in the 11th century B.C. defeat ed by the Canaanites who acquired control over a large area of Palestine, which control lasted until the time of David, Dorwood. Finally, when Samuel was sent as prophet, the people of Israel told him that they were constricted by their Bedouin life. And requested him to pray to God to appoint over them a king whom they could obey and do battle against the Philistines. In response to the request of Samuel, a person from amongst them was appointed king, whose name according to Kion was Talat, and Saul according to the Bible. Samuel 1.13, Talat fought the Philistines. At that time, David was a youth. He by accident became a member of the group of Talat. Jalat, Goliath, from amongst the Philistines sought a duel. David responded and killed him. This brought David such respect and glory amongst the Israelites that they made him king after Saul. This was the first time that God conferred prophethood on a king. The control of the people of Israel over Palestine was virtually completed during the time of David. 
After him, Solomon in 974 B.C. further consolidated power and brought his reign to its peak. On the order of God, he built Betel Maktis and named his kingship Judea following the name of his grandfather. However, in 938 B.C., after the death of Solomon, his son Roboam, who assumed power, not only ended by reason of his incompetency the religious and spiritual control but also caused great harm to the political stability of the kingdom. In his time, a former servant of Solomon rebelled and established a separate kingdom in the name of Israel. The result was that the people of Israel were divided into two kingdoms. In the north, the kingdom of Israel, whose capital was Samaria and in the south Judea whose capital was Jerusalem. The two kingdoms had for a long period of time religious and political differences which continued until the invasion of Nebuchadnezzar. Over a period of time, idolatry became rife in both lands. Hence, in order to remove such idolatry, prophets of God were sent from time to time. When the misdeeds of the people of Israel excelled all limits, God imposed on them a king Nebuchadnezzar, of Babylon, who in 586 BC fiercely attacked Jerusalem and finally destroyed it. The king of Jerusalem and the remaining Jews were taken prisoner and remained in slavery for years. Finally, when in 536 BC Cyrus of Iran conquered Babylon, he permitted the Jews to return to Jerusalem and rebuilt Betel Maktis. Consequently, in 515 BC it was rebuilt and Jews once again populated Jerusalem. The kingdom of Israel was prior to Judea destroyed at the hands of the Assyrians. And now, although their religious differences were reduced to a considerable extent, they did not acquire kingship. From 400 BC, the people of Israel lived under different kings. In 332 BC Alexander the Great acquired control and kingship over them. It was at that time that he translated the Old Testament which is well known as the Septuagint. In 160 BC the Syrian king Antiochus Epiphanius brutally killed them on a mass scale and burnt all the copies of the Old Testament. At this time, a brave person from amongst the people of Israel, known as Judah Maccabee formed a group and thereby acquired control over a large part of Palestine and put to flight the Assyrians. This rule of Maccabees lasted until 70 AD. Coming of Jesus apart from the small kingdom of Maccabees, the Jews of that time were dispersed. They had various settlements around the Mediterranean Sea. Upon the destruction of Babylon, a fairly large number of Jews settled in Palestine. But the majority were however resident in Babylon itself. The Romans ruled over a portion of Palestine, and this rule was under the control of Rome. Jerusalem was a sovereign state of Rome which was known as Roman Judea. A ruler was appointed by the Romans to rule over Jerusalem. The Jews, due to lack of material resources could not secure their freedom. Hence, their gaze was naturally fixed on the future. Many of them were awaiting a saviour from God who would free them from slavery and restore to them nationhood. Jesus was born in the reign of Emperor Augustus. We do not have a reliable record of the life of Jesus. We have only the Bible in its four books which is the only means of ascertaining the pure life of Jesus. However, the Bible in our view is not an authentic source. Resume of History of Christianity What is the beginning of Christianity which has assumed its present form? The detailed answer is to a great extent hidden. In the light of the available material, we know that after the ascension of Jesus into heaven, his disciples notwithstanding opposition became engrossed in propagation. They attained considerable success in spite of numerous obstacles. At that point, an even occurred which changed conditions completely. The event was that a well-known Jewish priest Saul who until that time was severely oppressing the followers of Christianity, suddenly accepted this faith. He claimed that on the road to Damascus, a light shone on him, and he heard the voice of Jesus from heaven. Why do you tease me, the event influenced him to the extent that his heart became inclined to Christianity. When Saul announced his conversion to the disciples, the majority of them refused to believe him. However, the first disciple to believe was Barnabas. The rest accepted this, and all of them included sale in their brotherhood. Saul changed his name to Paul, and thereafter devoted himself to propagation of Christianity. To the extent that as a consequence of his deep-seated effort and struggle, many people who were not Christians embraced Christianity. By reason of such service, his influence amongst the followers of this faith continued to grow. He gradually began to propagate the doctrine of the divinity of Christ, redemption, and incarnation. History indicates to this extent that some disciples openly opposed him at this juncture. 
However, what happened thereafter is completely clouded save that we know that the influence of Paul continued to increase. Age of Persecution Until the beginning of the 4th century AD, Christianity remained a subdued religion. Christian historians refer to that period as the Age of Persecution. At that time, the Romans from a political viewpoint ruled over the Christians. From a religious viewpoint, the Jews exercised supremacy over them. The Jews and Romans concurred in mocking and debasing them. A characteristic of this era is also that the system of worship and belief in Christianity was until then not codified. For this reason, a number of sects appeared in the Christian world of that time. Ignatius, 118 AD, Clement, 100 AD, Polycarp, 155 AD, Irenaeus, 188 AD, and others were the great theologians of the time whose writings formed the basis of Christianity. Constantine the Great The year 306 AD is a joyous one in the history of Christianity. Because Constantine I was made emperor of Rome in that year. He embraced Christianity and made it solid. This was the first time that the ruling emperor began propagating Christianity instead of persecuting its followers. He built many churches in Constantinople, Jerusalem, Rome and Tyre. And he honored the Christian theologians and caused them to be devoted to religious research. For this reason, various councils of theologians were held in different parts of the empire during his reign in which the system of Christian beliefs were systematically codified. In this regard, the Council of Nicaea, which was convened in AD 325 at Nicaea, is of fundamental importance at this council the doctrine of Trinity was for the first time held to be a cardinal belief of Christianity. The deniers of this belief, Arius and others were excommunicated. On this occasion, the Christian beliefs were for the first time recorded. And are well known as the Athanasian Creed, it is clear that the beliefs which are popularly known as the Athanasian Creed are not those of Athanasius, but were later denoted as such by somebody. Although the Council of Nicaea codified the basic beliefs, they were ambiguous to the extent that there were serious differences as to their interpretation for a considerable period. To resolve such differences as to their interpretation for a considerable period. To resolve such differences, the Christian theologians convened various councils at different places. These debates and disputes reached their pinnacle in the 5th and 6th centuries AD hence, this era is referred to by the Christian historians as, the Age of Councils, or the, Period of Controversy. From Constantine of Gregory for the period 313 AD to 539 AD, the Christian faith exercised supremacy over the Roman monarch. Despite opposition from idolatrous religions, Christianity was generally prevalent in the kingdom. In this period, the Roman legislature was also influenced by this faith. The outstanding feature of that time was that Christianity was divided over two kingdoms. The one was in the east which had its capital at Constantinople and which included Balkan, Greece, Asia Minor, Egypt and Abyssinia, and the greatest religious figure in the Eastern Empire was known as the Patriarch. The other kingdom was in the west whose capital was Rome, and most of the areas of Europe fell under it. The leading religious figure of the west was known as the Pope. Since the beginning there was mutual rivalry between the two empires, and each one tried to prove its religious superiority over the other. The second feature of this era was that monasticism and asceticism was widespread. The basic teaching of monasticism was that the pleasure of God could only be obtained by abandoning the pleasures of the world. To the extent that man will inflict pain on himself, he will attain nearness to God. Although the inclination to monasticism commenced from the 4th century AD, and in the 5th century AD there were many monasteries in Britain and France. The first monk however who developed a systemized organization was the 6th century monk Parkham. After him Basibius and Jerome were its well-known leaders. The Dark Ages In 590 AD, Gregory I became Pope. From his time to Charlemagne, 860 AD, represents the first part of what Christian historians describe as the Dark Ages. Because, this is the worst period in Christian history of political and intellectual decline and degeneration. An important reason for this was that Islam was in this period on the ascendancy, whilst dissension and disunity was rife amongst Christians. There are two important features of this period. The one is that the Western Christians commenced propagation of Christianity in various parts of Europe. For the first time, the Roman Christians acquired religious victory over Britain, Germany and other areas. The result was that after continued struggle for four centuries, the whole Europe became Christian. 
The second feature is that the sun of Islam began to rise in that period, and in a short time its rays spread over half the world. In the West Egypt, Africa, Spain and in the East Syria and Iran. For this reason, the Christian hold especially in the eastern regions began to break. The Middle Ages The period from 800 AD to 1521 AD is known as the Medieval Era. The basic feature of this era is the war between the Pope and the Emperor of the time which lasted for years. Alfred A. Garvey has divided this period into three parts. A. From Charlemagne to Pope Gregory VII, 800 to 1073, which period is characterized by the growing power of the papacy. B. From Gregory VII to Boniface VIII, 1073 to 1294, the time when the Pope exercised full sway in Western Europe. C. From Boniface VIII to the Reformat Ion, 1294 to 1517, the papacy declines, the need for reform asserts itself, and there are various movements towards it. We shall summarize below the important events of this era. The Great Schism The Great Schism is a term of Christian history which refers to the great dispute between the Easter and Western Church which resulted in the permanent separation and severance between the two. The Eastern Church henceforth called itself the Holy Orthodox Church. The main causes of this estrangement are the following. 1. The doctrinal differences between the two. The Eastern Church held that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father alone through the Son, but the Western that he proceeds both from the Father and from the Son. The former asserts a subordination of the Son to the Father, the latter maintains an equality of fat her and Son. The Eastern Church accused the Western Church of committing a serious wrong in attempting to distort the Nicene Creed by inserting a certain word therein to support its theories. 2. There was a consort of race. In the West, the Latin race had been affected by an infusion of Germanic blood. In the East, the Greek race had been blended with Asiatic peoples. 3. As stated previously, the division of the one Roman Empire into an Eastern and Western gave to Christ them two centers of authority and influence, and the new capital in the East. Constantinople became a formidable rival to the ancient city of Rome in the West. 4. The Pope in Rome was not, however, prepared to surrender to the Patriarch of Constantinople, or even to share with him, the primacy that the position of Rome hitherto had secured for its bishop. And for several centuries the contest for power was waged. v. When Leo IX in 1504 sought to force the views of the West on the East, and the Patriarch of Constantinople, Michael refused submission. The papal legates formally laid on the altar of Saint Sophia a sentence of anathema, and the schism was now complete. Religious Wars the second feature of this era is the religious wars which are referred to as the Crusades by Christian historians. The Muslims during the time of Caliph Umar had conquered the areas of Jerusalem, Palestine and Syria. At that time, the defense of itself by the Christian world was a serious problem. Hence, they could not proceed and conceive of the recovery of these holy lands. However, when the rising power of the Muslims was to an extent curtailed, and a degree of weakness entered into Muslim ranks, the Christian kings on the advice of their clergy decided once again to recover Jerusalem. These wars were fought against the Saljuk Turks and Ayubai emperors. Prior to these wars, Christianity did not know of religious wars or crusades. But in 1095, Pope Urban II announced at the Council of Clement that the crusades were religious wars. Clark, in his Short History of the Church, states in this regard. Urban, in order to entice people, announced that whoever participates in this war, he will certainly be forgiven. And like Muhammad, he promised that those who die on the battlefield will straight to paradise. In this way, seven crusades were fought, and the Christians were badly defeated at the hands of Saladin Ayyubi. Corruption of Papacy After the religious wars, the power and influence of the Pope began to wane to a considerable extent. But, the real decline began from the time of Pope Innocent IV, 1243. The reason for this decline was that Pope Innocent IV began to use his office for political and worldly gains. During his time trading in indulgences became rife, and members of opposition sects were burnt alive. Later popes took these inequitous measures to their extreme. During this period, Pope Boniface VIII became extremely opposed to Edward I and Philip IV of France. The result was that the papacy was completely ended in the Roman Empire for 71 years, 1305-1377. For this period, the popes lived in France. Hence, the period was referred to as the Babylonian Exile.
Then from 1375 to 1413, a new calamity arose, namely that two popes instead of one were elected. Each claimed absolute power, and were elected through cardinals. The one was elected for the areas of France, Spain and the other for Italy, England and Germany. The latter was referred to as the Roman Pope. This separation is referred to by some historians as the Great Schism. Attempts in the name of reform. At the height of papal corruption, there were a number of attempts at reformation. Amongst the forerunner was John Wycliffe, 1324 who was an opponent of the corruption and abuses of the church, and a claimant of the election of righteous popes. He was the first to cause the Bible to be translated into English, which was published in 1385. Whereas, prior to that, it was a serious crime to translate the Bible in any other tongue. Influenced by his teaching, John Hus and Jerome upheld the cause of reform. With a view to ending the papal controversy and great schism, the Council of Pisa was convened in 1409. Eighty bishops were present and they removed from office both popes, and elected as Pope, Alexander V. But he died immediately. Thereafter, a pirate John was elected Pope. But he could not suppress his contemporary popes. The result was that instead of two, there were three popes in office and the rift in the church became even greater. Finally, in November 1414 a council was convened at Constance, at which not only was the great schism completed, but also the reformist teaching of John Huss was declared heretic. In the result, Huss and his pupil Jerome were burnt alive, and the moral and religious degeneration of the church was maintained. However, the movement of John Huss was alive, and could not be suppressed by force. Its adherents grew in time to the extent that the Pope perceived his power to be under threat. An attempt was then made at the Council of Basel in 1431 to suppress the reformist movement by means of argument but with no effective result. Era of Reform and Protestantism Finally in 1483 the founder of Protestantism, Martin Luther was born. He hammered the final nail in the coffin of papacy. He first announced his opposition to commerce in indulgences. When this was accepted, he rebelled against the extraordinary power of the Pope, and apart from baptism and the Lord's Supper, he regarded all other rituals as an innovation of the Roman Church. In Switzerland, Ulrich, Swingley raised the same voice of reform. Thereafter, John Calvin in the early 16th century, in Geneva, gave this movement impetus and wide significance. To the extent that the voice of reform reached France, Italy, Germany and the rest of Europe. Finally the kings of England Henry VII and Edward VI were influenced by the movement so that Protestantism became a strong opponent of Catholicism. Renaissance This was the era in which Europe outstripped the world in scientific and technological advancement. The people of Europe who were till then steeped in superstition now became alive. The abuse of papacy and corruption of the church created in their hearts a deep rancor towards religion. Martin Luther for the first time ventured to differ with his predecessors in the interpretation of the Bible and wage war against the church. But when this door was opened once, it continued to remain open. Luther only arrogated to himself the interpretation of the Bible. Even he did not dare to criticize the book itself. However, those after him who raised the banner of rationalism did not spare the Bible in their criticism. They criticized each and every doctrine of Christianity and reduced them to the level of mockery. Their approach was to test every claim of religion on the altar of reason. And to reject anything which was irrational, even if the church valued such teachings for centuries. They called themselves rationalists and their epoch, the age of reason. William Shillingworth, 1602-1644, is the foremost leader of this group. He raised the voice of rationalism for the first time. Lord Herbert 1583-1648 and Thomas Hobbes 1588-1671 etc. were also leading figures of rationalism. No doctrine was safe from the sweep of rationalism. To the extent that skeptics such as Voltaire 1694-1788 emerged who even openly sowed the seeds of doubts in the existence of God, and later openly negated the existence of God. Bertrand Russell, the well-known philosopher of our age, is the final adherent of this group. The Era of Modernism the reaction of rationalism on the adherents of Christianity was twofold.
one was that some people were overcome by rationalism and began to make changes to the faith. This movement is known as modernism. They hold that whilst the faith is fundamentally correct, its interpretation and application has proceeded on an incorrect basis. The Bible contains sufficient flexibility to be adapted to the scientific advances of each age. For this purpose, certain unimportant portions of the Bible could be disregarded, and its words and traditional import could be sacrificed. According to Dr. Paul Lane the leader of this movement was Rousseau. In recent times, Professor Harnack and Renault were also well-known adherents thereof. Movement of Revivalism The second consequence of rationalism which arose as a reaction to it was that a movement emerged to revive Roman Catholicism known as Catholic Revival Movement. The proponents of this movement waged war against the rationalists. They asserted that Christianity is the same as expounded by their predecessors, and as defined continuously by the various councils. Hence, the Church must be the supreme power. There was no need to make changes to Catholic doctrines. This movement began in the 19th century. This was the time when the West was licking its wounds in the wake of experiencing fully materialism. Once again there was in consequence of the great uneasiness wrought by materialism, a feeling of return to the spirit. The movement of revivalism enlisted such people and once again reverted to those doctrines of Christianity which brought it to the throes of destruction in the 13th and 14th century. Amongst the leading proponents of this movement J.A. Knox, 1757-1831 A.D., J.H. Newman, 1801-1890, Hural Frond, 1803-1836 and Richard William Church, 1815-1890, worthy of mention. In the Christian world these three movements, rationalism, modernism and the revivalism, have remained, and members of all three movements are found in great numbers.